We are now, we are live. Um, so welcome everyone to Nonfiction Book Club on our special night. We're here on a Friday instead of Saturday. We're bringing that Friday energy to talk about. I like to watch. Oh, you got we a different have a, one. Yeah, I don't know if this is like a newer edition. Maybe uh, maybe that's what's yours going is, on. Is the, yours is paperback, yeah. Oh, yeah, 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 maybe that's part of it. Because I always thought, knew it from the white cover. So when this came in, I was like, it's not. Yes. And so I'm like curious about that change. Because it's just it's just the color. The rest is. Yes, the, switch, the, the switch to the, the switch to paperback. They made a new cover. I don't know. Yeah. It's weird. That's it's like, weird. No more. <clears throat> yeah, mm. but we'll never know. We'll um, never know. You are here on my channel on the Okie Dokie Bokie. Um, that's where we're doing doing the book club this week. Mm -hmm. uh, usually, we we I feel like our our general trend has been we talk about serious books. Yeah, and I think we've been at least I have lately been in a place where I'm like I need a moment. <laughs> like, I need to Over reset. It. No, like, I, I don't want to. That's yeah. too many thoughts. I don't want to yeah. have that many thoughts. Thank you. Yeah. I know this I, is a book I, club. Um, but um, what I'd like to talk about is not books right now. I'd like to have, I'd like to use fewer brain cells yes. in this book club. Except that, like, she's so Emily Nussbaum wrote this book. I like to watch about TV, and it's about TV, but she's a smart person writing about TV. That's so, true. in reading, I had to use the brain cells. I did but use I just, a lot like, of brain cells, yeah. But I got to apply it to the TV. There was, there was, um, there, serotonin was also being activated yeah. with the brain cells in a way yes. that, like, for example, um, you know, reading about Nazis didn't, like, it didn't, yeah. that was not doing the ser, that was just brain cells. Yes. And no serotonin. None no, whatsoever. No, the opposite. <laughs> the opposite. Yeah. Uh, yeah. It was Coming like, let's actually loans, reduce your overall supply of serotonin where i'm actually yep. just gonna my brain was like no you don't you have too much yep. <laughs> um uh so anyway so i actually remember <laughs> hearing about this book from you like i feel like for some reason i don't know if i like what the context was but i had first heard about this book from you and i had this whole crisis last month where i was like we're gonna we're gonna read something about tv the book that i thought i was gonna read i was like maybe this isn't right because it's about survivor couldn't tell it was the whole thing if it was gonna be right so i was mm -hmm. like how about this one? Yeah. And you were very accommodating to the idea of rereading. Uh, I like to watch, which I'm glad because I've been wanting to read this book a lot for a while. It's fun. It's a fun time. We just talk about TV. Come on. Yep. Yeah. So Emily Nussbaum is a writer for The New Yorker. Um, she writes about TV. And so this book is, a lot of it is collections of things that she has written for the magazine. Um, there are a few profiles of TV writers, but there's also a lot of reviews and just general like critical essays about TV in the book as well. And I think one or two essays might be original. Um, I couldn't remember. Yes, yes, there are there are a few that she wrote specifically for this. Um, like the opening, the first essay, the yeah. um, the Woody Allen one is specifically yeah. for the book. There, yeah, there are yeah. a few. Yeah, and then there's like some themes as well. Um, like there's she gives them all like uh uh there's like she sort of blurbs them all at the beginning of even so even the ones that are like republished yeah. are given a very specific context for like the threading of of the. Yeah. They are arranged in a very specific order um, yeah. to to construct a like a larger argument about television. And so, in addition to like reprinting the essays, she also includes some like context, interstitial yeah. context for her. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I like that because especially like it was really cool seeing her notes about like things that she had written in the past. Because I yeah. feel like there are times where you like think about I don't know like either read an old journal entry or like I'll like watch an old video of mine and be like, huh, like mm -hmm. I had strong feelings about that thing. <laughs> like, uh -huh. Do I still have the feelings? And like reading her thoughts about things that she's written before, sometimes like she felt more reaffirmed in her opinions and sometimes a little bit more shaky. Uh -huh. I really enjoyed that. And she could also kind of in incorporate some of the discourse that it inspired <clears throat> too, which was also yeah. really interesting. I mean, like uh, stand out to me uh, on that front is that like she prefaced the, so she gave, not great reviews of both True Detective and Marvelous Mrs. Maisel and basically like True De and you know it's a little bit of the there are very gendered like reasons basically mm -hmm. for this that like you know a bad review of a show like True Detective um, 
white male anti-hero vibes yeah. uh was a lot of like you're a fucking idiot you just don't get it um yeah. type thing. like she gets it she just didn't like it um versus yeah. like Maisel um which I love I love I love that show um <laughs> we'll we'll get to I'm I'm on a whole a whole kick I love that show yeah. um I uh but <laughs> fully fully agree with yeah. Like, I get it. Like, I get her her general. Like, I get why the show doesn't work for her and why. Yeah. I think it's funny, too, though, because she talks about how – so the show didn't work for her. And she talks about how, like, on paper, she should be the target audience. But I actually feel like, to me, that kind of thing, that means it's – you're the hardest sell. Oh, my God, yes. Like, if yeah. you're the tar- – if in that way where it's, like, this feels so primed for me – in a lot of ways, like that means you're the one who's going to be the most inclined to uh, like have a very specific vision for how the thing should play out. I mean, like yeah. in her critique of the show, she interweaves it with a lot of uh, really specific history about like comedy and women in comedy and like and like the time um, uh, where the show is set, which like this is not information that I knew mm-hmm. when I started watching yeah. the show. I don't know. It's just it's Gilmore Girls, but comedian and historic is that's that's like yeah. that's what the show is mm-hmm. doing. Right. Um, I don't know quirky fun she's cute um but like her coming at it with this very specific like i understand a lot of like what like what your reference material is here and like that is like that makes it harder to watch because yeah. uh you know you have the the reference you, you have such an like a deep yeah. knowledge deep connection to this is, the, that this is really funny to me because um my husband and i are working on watching Never Have I Ever season two. And he has a much easier time watching it than I do. So Never Have I Ever is uh, Mindy Kaling's show on Netflix. Oh, yeah, 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 yes, 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 yes. yes, yes, And so it has this Indian American protagonist and she's like in high school, she's very messy, but she's also very charming and sweet. She has these Mm -hmm. friends that are also like very funny. She has a hot guy that she's debating between and a not so hot guy that she's also debating between, which I don't understand. I have strong feelings on this, but anyways. Team hot, team hot guy, team hot guy, yeah, team yeah, hot guy yeah. all the way. Especially if you're in high school, like there, she's in high school. This is a rom com. Yeah. Let let the nerdy girl yeah. date the hot guy, and that, yeah. have that be it. Yeah, and so I. I have a hard time watching from like the proximity thing. It's something I've been thinking about with like a lot of different media um, because like there are different ways that we all feel like proximity. Like there's like very clear identity things like the Indian American part, but then also she has this cousin who's in grad school at Caltech and she's doing like a biology. And so I went to undergrad for Caltech. So I have some feelings about some of the portrayals there where I'm like, this is silly. But then also <laughs> like this season has this whole plot where she's like doing a rotation and like is dealing with like very like, like big important things about sexism and science. And it's like very much like a, yes, these things are real, but also the sequence of events that you are doing in this plot to get her there make zero sense. Mm, <laughs> like, because just like based on my experience in a lab and I'm just like so hung up. I also have a hard time watching the show because Debbie is like so, like I just like see so much of my like high school insecurities in her that like mm. I like I just cringe so much when she makes mistakes in a way that like I can't give her leeway that I want to yeah. give her that I and that I would give to other characters because I'm like I I, I identify too Me. close with yeah. well yeah. and the show in general is so like secondhand embar- embarrassment yeah and cr- like it's very you have to be very you have to be like accept a certain measure of that and I imagine yeah. it has to be 400,000 times harder though when you're like <laughs> yeah. no but it's me. Yeah. <laughs> You're yeah. me. Yeah. Uh, it doesn't help yeah. that anytime she does something ridiculous, my husband looks at me and is like, so. Oh no. <laughs> like, oh, no. I know. <laughs> I agree. <laughs> <laughs> and then at the same time he's like why don't you watch this show with me and I'm like this is why <laughs> sir <laughs> you can't make fun of me and then get mad be like why are you not watching the show um, Yeah. I also um, really quickly while we are talking about the show would like to continue to make the pitch though for everybody to watch this show it's a very cute like teenage yeah. rom-com thing it's it also though um, one of my favorite things in media that's what that's the dressing teen rom-com it's actually a secret grief show yeah. um is that's really like what's very happening well done. yeah very well yeah. Done. that's that's I, like the core that's like keeping me like i'm gonna finish season two because i am like 
that emotional arc for her and her family is like so well done. I, and crushing. I only dimly remember that I watched the whole second season in a night. Like I sat down thinking, okay, I'll watch a couple episodes. It was like a, I was up until like 3 a.m. or whatever to to finish it. And all I really remember about the second season is just like so, it's just me on my couch alone in my house sobbing just like ugly yeah. just uh yeah. crying i highly recommend that experience for everyone yeah, uh, yeah. anyway yeah this is why i picked this book because i feel like so much of what this book is about is like what it is and like she says this it's like or like throughout her reviews like a lot of what it is is like about being a fan like the different yeah. ways there are of being a fan and i love the way that she explored that through like Mm -hmm. both the uh the ups and downs of that being a fan but also uh like a, a big huge i mean like i don't know i think her like central argument is also a, is really like how um is about how we talk about tv like mm -hmm. fun and, and like how we decide what is art and what is valued as art and um and like and, and she looks at this from like several different angles. Like, yes, like, so as a fan, like that being one of them, like, you know, what does it mean to be a fan? What are the ways of being a fan? Um, uh, but also like, you know, critical acclaim this, uh, I mentioned like the, the sexism thing. And like, that's a huge, like the, the, the first essay sort of talks about uh, uh, a, a, the, a show that she mentions which she, there is not a single essay about Buffy the Vampire Slayer, but yeah. she mentions Buffy the Vampire Slayer like a hundred times um, yeah. in this book, usually as this touch touchstone of like um, the, like cause the opening essay is, is uh, talks a lot about like, um, I think it's the first one, uh, but talks about like the Sopranos as, and like the way the Sopranos gets, gets credited as like the pivotal moment of the transition to golden era television or whatever. Mm -hmm. And like, um, and like, but she talks about how for her uh, that like Buffy the Vampire Slayer was this like this huge moment because it changed her understanding of like how TV could play out. And so like, there's that. The Sopranos is another thing she, that one actually does get an essay, but it's another one she references a lot. Usually in that it's like a, it's a stand in for like, there's a specific kind of show that's allowed to be considered like peak TV and golden era mm -hmm. TV. And then her other kind of favorite thing to go back. Like that's a theme that she talks about a lot throughout is like different kinds of shows that are like, no, but this should be, and this should be um, like a, a lot of her, the show specific ones are like, it's essentially the case for why Jane the Virgin and Adventure Time mm -hmm. and like all of these other shows deserve similar like treatment and respect. And like, sort of all tv it's a little bit of like her um yeah. you know her thesis there and i yeah and then also the there's like the professionalism angle of it too with like the profiles of of showrunners and like the judgy kohan and um uh um ryan murphy profiles i did not read those so my this is going off of my yeah. um several years old memory of them but they stand out. I, yeah. yeah. I remember. Yeah. Well, because I think they're they're also interesting because I think, I definitely remember this from the Genji Cohen one. I'm pretty sure it's from the Ryan Murphy. No, yeah, it's definitely in the Ryan Murphy one because he talks about um, like being sensitive. Like, so there's that other side of it. And this also, I think it's in the, um, the what was the other one? Uh, who's the, I'm completely blanking on the name, the creator of um, Blackish. Can you, can oh, you uh, Kenya Barris. Kenya Barris. 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 Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. um yeah so all of them like engage both with like the creator and also the creator's engagement with the audience reaction and like uh -huh. to what extent they do or don't and like that is it, and that comes up also there's an essay about lost, lost. um and the lot ending to lost and just the way that fans and creators interact too mm -hmm. like that whole thing i, I find and especially because she's coming at it as a critic so she's like in this weird space too where like uh -huh. she is a fan but she's also writing you know professionally about uh -huh. these shows like that is like a weird space too yes yes yeah the yeah that's the and that's that's like a tension that comes up throughout too is like this idea of like the space between like i am i am a fan of tv that's like why i do the job that i do but also yeah. this is my job to it is my job to write these things and that yeah. that's a an interesting an interesting tension throughout sorry you were going to say something though about the fan stuff and i um derailed oh. that to talk about the no no i think that book. was like perfect um i mean one thing like based on just like what you were just saying that i was thinking about um so the one of the essays that i really 
uh, I mean, enjoyed is a tough word, but it's, I, I appreciate it a lot was the Woody Allen one. The, um, oh my God. I have thought about that, that essay so much. Yeah. I, that one I actually have re-listened to in the time since, like I originally read this book oh, in yeah. like 2018, 19, something like that. I don't know. Definitely pre-pandemic. Cause I remember listening to it on the treadmill. <laughs> um, <so laughs> I the memory of being at the gym while I listened yeah. to this book. Uh, but that one I have like re-listened to just because it's like, it, I mean, it's, it's the most evergreen of topics. Yeah. Um, and if you're like, if you are a, you know, if you're like very into media and like, and talking about it online, you have a whole, yeah. like, that's a huge chunk of how you spend yeah. your time. Like there yeah. it's, it's, it's like big and thorny and, um, uh, and yeah. it comes up all the time. All the time. <laughs> like, every day. Someone is typing into the internet. I have separated the art from the artist. <laughs> like uh -huh. that is something that happens. Uh -huh. Um, and it's also kind of, I mean, again, not funny, but a little funny um, because she does reference Buffy so many times. Yes. She does talk about talking to Joss Whedon. So there is this element of reading both this book and the specific essay. So for people who haven't read the book, Confessions of, a Human Shield, of the Human Shield, uh, basically taking on that question, like, to simplify of like separating the art and the artist, but she's exploring a lot of the different ways that this, she, this is like shown up in her own engagement with media. Um, so like she starts off with Woody Allen, who like was someone whose art she really, really, really loved growing up. Um, but then another like really sharp turn that this essay takes is when she talks about um, Louis C.K. Yeah. And um, how like she had sort of heard rumors about like his whole like, you know, masturbating in front of people without their consent kind of thing, uh, not kind of thing, actual thing. Um, and then had like this whole thing where it was all rumors, but she invited him out to a panel. And it was like this whole weird thing. Like that's where the human shield, I think really for me felt most apparent in the essay. Cause it is like very much like that kind of reputational uh, aspect of it all where like he is because his stuff is not like officially confirmed in the media like uh, her inviting him out to this you know panel feels like somehow complicit even if she is like not entirely sure what's going on either right. so it's like very like especially that's where for me i was thinking about it as that line between critic and fan where like i can be a fan i'm not inviting someone out to a panel like that is right. a different level of engaging with the art um, mm -hmm, yeah, mm -hmm, that essay, mm -hmm. I, I, I also feel like I will return to, um, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, and uh, the, the, one of the things that she talks about in there too, that I, I think about all the time is the, she, and it's in some ways very specific to her and that because she is a critic, like you know, there's like the professional thing is, is a, is a component of this, but I think it's relevant. Um, and like affects a lot of the way that I think about or relates to a lot of how I think about media too, in that, um, you know, when she talks about Woody Allen, she's like, I can't, for example, pretend I have never seen these movies. Like I don't get to, I don't, I cannot like eliminate that from my understanding of of the canon. Um, mm -hmm. Like I, I, you know, there, there, there are, there are certain things that are like actually not possible. Um, yeah. in terms of, like these are experiences that I have had, they were really formative experiences. Um, and so like, there's a certain level at which it, uh, like it is, I don't know, like I, I, like I say this as somebody who is very active, like, yes, we throw, you know, throw, throw it all mm -hmm. away, whatever. But like, there is, there's like an internal piece of this that is always, always going to be more complicated than that. Like you can't, like, you, yeah. you don't, you cannot unread or unwatch what you have already read and watched. And those things yeah. are a part of you. And like, I think that this is, that's interesting in the context of um, like criticism more broadly. This is the thing that I, like, I, um, uh, on Stark Squad Pod, we would talk about this a lot about uh, how Mari and I are both the, the the type of person to often read reviews before we go in and record the podcast, and mm -hmm. it's interesting. Um, it was interesting, especially in like the first year that we were doing it, how much like people like our guests would talk about would frequently we would have guests mention not doing this like not like mm -hmm. making a point of like coming in to give us their like pure opinion <laughs> and the process of doing the podcast especially like really really gave me uh, I don't know convinced me of the absurdity of that premise that mm -hmm. like there is no 
like I, I am bringing the sum of an experience into the media um, in this way that like the, every show that I watch is kind of in conversation with every show I've watched before it. And so the idea of like a, a discreet, discreet unit of, of criticism, discreet unit of reaction, pure reaction or whatever, just feels absurd. Like it feels absurd to suggest that you can have that. Um, and also yeah. I don't care and I'm not interested in, in achieving it separately. Like I think that the yeah. value, I think the value of all of this stuff is, is like the dialogue. Um, I don't know. Yeah. Anyway, I'm getting a little bit away from the, like the bad fan thing, but uh, yeah. or the, not the, whatever, separating the art from the artist. That fan yeah. is a whole separate thing, also. Uh, yeah. Also here. <laughs> um, but... well, we're we're going to get there, I'm sure. <laughs> yeah. um, but I wanted to highlight this comment because yes. um, I think it's super uh, important. Like, part of what her point is is like, uh, you can't separate like the, like the medium that these things exist in, like from mm -hmm. their own history. Like, I was thinking yeah. about this when you were talking about, uh, like, when you were talking about something like Harry Potter, where, yeah. like, you know, I, like whatever like extent I'm like going to like not engage with like the world of Harry Potter now doesn't erase the fact that both it was incredibly formative to me growing up mm -hmm. and also it was incredibly formative to an industry it was informative to a lot of writers right. and I think that's both for good and for bad like even like Twilight you know like that has informed a lot of the way that publishing has gone and so you know there's I I don't care about Twilight. I like I it was not formative to me because I didn't read it, but like so I don't have that emotional investment. But like if I'm gonna like think about books overall, like if I'm gonna try to like if I want to understand right. them in that context, and you don't have to, but if you want to, like you're gonna need to acknowledge Twilight and even maybe like engage with it and I, yeah, it's yeah. it's hard. Like you don't have to. <laughs> like, right, I, yeah, I'm yeah. not saying like we all gotta go out and read Twilight. We all gotta go out and read the problematic canon or anything. No, 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 no. Um, but yeah, it's 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 just that we can't. I mean, to, to Colby existed. to Colby's point, you can't understand the history of like sitcoms with, and yeah. like and, and not talk about the Cosby Show like that. that yeah. That's not. Uh, yeah um, yeah and i think he, like the, the cosmic show shows up in this book frequently as well yeah. like that like just like completely i don't know about coincidentally but like yeah like to that point like lot, yeah. in this book it it's clearly a part of the history and I, yeah i with tv with tv and movies yeah, i think that it is in infinitely more complex like one thing <clears throat> the thing about books that makes them a little bit different is the degree to which they are the i mean there are actually like whole teams of people that contribute to the process of getting a book mm -hmm. to, to done but like the there is an author like a yeah. person that's associated with the thing in a way that a tv show especially is and she talks about this a lot in the book actually like tv shows are understood as collaborative projects um yeah. in this way that like does it, it it does like actually make it more complicated when you say well this one person a significant person who contributed to this mm -hmm. collaborative project is a piece of shit but like <laughs> yeah. the rest of the, i don't know you yeah. know and like where how what is and like and i don't say this as like i don't know i i I say this purely like as question, like as like, yeah. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, like the going to the Buffy of it all, it's like Buffy's place in the canon is as a feminist TV show and is like yes. being really formative to like a certain feminist analysis of media. And now at the same time, that analysis has to be like done alongside everything that Whedon has like, yeah. has done as well. And like, like you can't listen to Charisma Carpenter talk about being punished for her pregnancy and not include that in your feminist analysis yeah. of yeah. Buffy. Like that's like a part of it. One thing though is that much like Woody Allen, it's like it's text uh, with Joss mm -hmm. Whedon. There's there's just it's there's so much there. Like uh, yeah. Buffy, Buffy's the fact that the fact that yep. Buffy never had a good fucking relationship. Yep. The entire yep. plot line that they used with around Charisma Car Carpenter's pregnancy, yep. like the utter 
insanity uh, of, you know, the, the demonic turn that he gave <laughs> yeah. her. Like yeah. there it's, it's right. It's right there. Yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> it was, it was wide open. Yeah. Uh, and so, like the rowling of it all too. Like yes. it was always it there. Was always right in front of us actually. Yeah. Um, yeah. So there's that. I, yeah. Buffy is definitely one that I have. Um, I have like really similar feelings to some of a little bit of like what she's talking about about in the um the Woody Allen one in that if it's like formative for me because it we were like reca recapping that show mm -hmm. like shaped a lot of the way that I engage with media like it it like it changed it changed my relationship with television in this way that like yeah like there's no I can't unwind that like I can't unhave yeah. that really formative yeah. experience um and also Joss Whedon is a piece of shit. Like both of those things are true. And yeah. <laughs> I just have to like accept both. I just have to live with complexity. Terrible. Yeah. I hate it. Yeah. <laughs> I hate that for me. Yeah. yeah. I mean, that's like the thing that's like, I mean, like for me, it's Harry Potter. Like Harry Potter was the thing that like got me on the, well, it didn't get me on the internet. The internet got me on the internet. But like sure, I sure. like found like communities, like fandom, like all of that was through Harry Potter. And like, I still like it's it's so like flat now or like it feels so superficial now but like when I think when it was book four or five came out and like that was like a time when like Bush was president like and that was like oh like the leader in this fictional world that we're all like obsessed with is like also terrible like well, like there's something about like those critiques being simultaneous like the the real life of experience of like not trusting your your president is like and when you're like growing up and you're realizing like oh you you can't trust your president and like reading that in a book as well like yeah. there was a lot about that um that was yeah I don't know it's just like it was like formative and like yeah I can like look back and see the the glaring holes in all of it now and like I wouldn't overstate like how much it was saying but Right. It is like a thing that informed how I approached media or like how I learned to approach books overall and to like read deeper into the text and to do it outside of the classroom. Right. It was like mm -hmm. not just like I'm looking for a symbol. It's like, oh, this is like actually how I want to enjoy my books when I'm reading them on my own. You know, uh huh. Uh huh. Yeah. Uh huh. Yes. Yes. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, the fandom stuff, that's interesting. That um, maybe we, yeah, bad fans, maybe. Yes, yeah, let's, let's do it. That, because that's another one that I think about all the time. I think about it, um, I forget sometimes though how much of when I'm thinking about it, uh, um, even after like just recently reading this chapter again, um, I still can't tell you how much of what I'm thinking about is this book and how much of it mm -hmm. is a an episode of the podcast Fansplaining um, mm -hmm. that came out about like bad fans around the same time that I was reading this book too. So yeah. like they're very, it's like a very smashed up in my brain but anyway in the context of this book recapping um the essay in question uh is and i mean it's a thing that comes up in other places the specific essay about this though is about um all in the family um it's also like it's just a really interesting bit of television history mm -hmm. to the this chapter and talking about like um, Norman Lear and like the creation of all in the family and and all of that that super interesting um but uh, that the idea of like authorial intent and like what the goal was in creating a character like Archie Bun Bunker, uh, who, if you, I guess it's a very old show, so it's entirely possible you don't know. Um, it, it, Archie Bunker, very racist old man. Um, that's it's you know, uh, 70s sitcom, um, racist old man. He has you know, a uh, a daughter and a like very very liberal uh son-in-law they fight all the time um and the idea is the idea was that in writing this character who was like very crass who um you know it was like a bit of a fight with the networks to let him like say all the things that they wanted him to say but the point was that this man would be just so obviously like racist and terrible and but like in order to make him real you had to have him say the terrible things but like he's clearly a shitty person um except plot twist audiences <laughs> identified with him um uh and so there's like a larger um i don't know question there about like 
there's a lot of questions there, I guess, actually, about like yeah. responsibility um, and like uh, how how you under like how exactly do you evaluate that work um, and like th those consequences and that impact uh, and yeah, it's yeah, uh, it's messy. I don't know. Yeah. I don't. I don't believe she talks about it in here. This is this is the podcast. Mm. Uh, the other big example of this is, um, oh God, the cartoon with the old. There's old grandpa and then a uh, um, and their alien. Oh my God. Mm -hmm. Rick and Morty. Mm. Rick and Morty uh, is like a major example of this. Um, uh, this sort of phenomenon of like, th there's like a big, there's a, you know, what Dan Harmon believes he has created. Um, mm -hmm. and then like, you know, there, there are many people who are watching the, watching the show in the way that Dan Harmon intends for them to watch the show. But then, um, there are yeah. a lot of people watch it in, in much the same way that, you know, people watched all of the family and identified with Archie Bunker. Um, yeah. Yeah. And now I'm, yeah, I don't know, I'm recalling. <laughs> yeah, no, it's funny, like, as you were describing, I was thinking about, like, all the times we've, like, we've had, like, several conversations about Authorial Intent, I think, on, like, Snark Squad and on uh, Booknet Fest. Booknet and, like, it and generally like, lost, but it was yeah. so good. Like, yeah, I know that nobody will believe me, and it's so <laughs> easy for me to say this because the recording was lost, but it, it was, was a great really panel. good panel. It was yeah. so it was really, and only like six people attended it. There was like yeah. nobody in the room, but I swear yeah. to you, it was a great it was panel. So it was like a like um, romance panel or something happening at the same time. Yeah. We didn't stand a chance. No. Uh, <laughs> and uh, so like all the times we've talked about authorial intent, me, we, me, I've definitely been on like generally on the side of like, I feel like your work should speak for itself. And also I feel like, you know, like once you publish it, it's out in the world, it's, not yours anymore. It's not yours. It At the same to you time, anymore. there's the thing then where it's like, okay, if it's ours now, I feel very comfortable being like, but you are wrong in how you have chosen to engage with this. Uh -huh, uh -huh. Like, or at least I feel entitled to that. I'm uh -huh. not, but I feel entitled. But it's like it's complicated too, though. Like, yeah, uh, yeah uh, yes. Like, like thinking about this, like this kind of example too. It's like I, I, I. I definitely am very like death of the author in the sense of like, yes, I don't really give a shit how you intended for me to read this. Like here is the read that the, here's the read that I got. Um, and I don't know if you wanted me to read it differently, you should have said it better. Yeah. Um, but, but like also uh, I don't know, like I, that like the, again, these very specific examples of like people, like the Archie Bunker, like I, uh, that. Yeah. It's more, I think the, the, the overwhelming sensation that I have when I think about that is feeling sad for, <laughs> I'm like, that sucks, man. <laughs> you, yeah, you, put, yeah. you, you made this thing and you work so hard on it. Um, yeah. And then this is what, I don't know, this was the read, this was the interpretation. Damn. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And it's also like at that point, it's like, maybe it, maybe what it is it's like what i'm sad about is not even the author's intent like what i'm sad about is that people just chose to identify in this way so it's like yeah. well that's that's the thing but okay so not to make this about vanderpump rules but to yes. make it about vanderpump Let's rules go. because i was very excited to find that there was a, a little bit of a review um of vanderpump rules and one of the like thinking about the the bad fan makes me think about bravo real housewives and like there are very different camps of fans for um, like Real Housewives and Vanderpump Rules. Like there is what I consider the right type of fan, which is someone who is like, you know, this is a weird world that we are watching. Like, especially something like Vanderpump Rules, nothing about Vanderpump Rules to me is aspirational. Like no. these are people who have absolutely fucked each other over and are staying together They're as a friend unit because they are want to be on TV. Yeah. Purely opportunistic reasons. Yes. And everybody knows it. Like, and they, like yeah. they all know this internally as well. But yeah. Like this yeah. is a monetary relationship. Our yeah. friendship is to get paid. Yeah. <laughs> and then, but like what I have learned from the internet is that there are people who do watch the show sincerely and uh -huh. like, find themselves like 
like, look, I'm personally invested in these people's lives. So I'm not going to pretend that I am like above that, but like right. who are like sincerely, I don't know if they're looking up to them, but they like, they find something like that they're rooting for in uh-huh. the show in a way. And like, there are things that I root for in the show. Like there are individual relationships where I'm like, you know, I hope it works well for them. And I hope yeah. that outside of the show that they're happy, but uh-huh. like, especially like also like real housewives, like people get like very like, Stanish about like real housewives in a way that I absolutely don't understand because like they're real housewives. The whole point of real housewives to me is to put a bunch of people in a room who are never gonna be right. Like even when right. they're wrong, they are mm-hmm. going to be wrong. Even when they're right, they're gonna be wrong about something. Like mm-hmm. I have come close to standing for a few people, but like I'm gonna be wrong when I do it. <laughs> There's nothing aspirational about their uh-huh. lives and. Uh-huh. That is the thing that I think about with the bad fan thing. Um, maybe just because that's, it just drives me crazy when I like get like enmeshed in like weird fan wars, but also just because I find it a weird, like, I don't know, like to me, the show itself is also kind of like, look at these people. They're so weird. Like, yeah. It's, yeah. It yeah, seems, yeah. 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 Especially Vanderpump yeah. Rules, which yeah. is truly also, a nonsense they're show. They're truly, Yeah. They're all bad people. And also like the way that the show navigates the like the conceit of being a reality TV show. I just Sheena's wedding process talk. Every time Sheena said the words, I did all this on a waitress's salary. Yeah. I wanted to die. Okay. I will can, okay. Can I tell you about this most recent season? Please. I will because it's, watch it. It's, yeah, I, the, the, that's fine. The, I, 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 for context, I did. I actually, this, that, that rereading this essay was great now because she, it's at about as far as I got. So yeah. it was like, I'm like, cool. That's about as far as you need to watch. She's, uh, we've covered, she's not talking about anything that I missed. Yeah. Um, so I understand. I had full context for everything that she was talking about. Um, but also I, uh, yeah, I, everybody on this show sucks and like, they're all bad people. Um, and then it, like, it just, it also, it just hit a point where I was like, I actually can't, like, it was yeah. fun and then it's stopped being fun. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I am, I am only watching it now because I have spent so much time. There's, That's my, I a lot of my relationship with the challenge. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. But listen, I've been, the, I've been with these people <laughs> for too long, yeah. too, for too long now. I've been watching yeah. like CT's real world season, CT yeah. Paris, real world Paris. I was in high school. I am 30. <laughs> I'm about to turn 34 next month okay yeah. we yeah. we have history these are my yeah. imaginary friends i cannot i can't yeah. the, the, listen yeah. <laughs> this is what it is <laughs> yeah so i was gonna say because you brought up sheena's wedding this most recent season not to spoil it for anyone because it's not um, you can't whatever like no. if you haven't watched it by now it's because you don't care about vanderpump rules which is totally fair yeah. um but so so sheena's thing now is she uh over the pandemic uh found herself a new guy he's like this australian dude a little bit sketch in some ways um but they i don't know they seem happy and they have a kid together and now they had a baby and so he clearly at some point the idea was that they were going to get married during this season but mm-hmm. none of it lined up because of like i think there were covid scheduling issues and stuff but somebody <laughs> else got engaged on the show so dj james kennedy and raquel got engaged and they were having an engagement party at the James, end of the and who who's the girl i don't know if you ever met raquel, um, raquel. that sounds familiar was... i think i'm i think maybe she popped up at like the end like right like, yeah the last episodes. yeah she didn't anyway. really do much but this season she showed up and she's actually very sweet which is why she probably shouldn't be on the show um, or marrying but... that man well, oh well <laughs> we'll get there <laughs> oh, <laughs> they a piece they of shit have... The season ended with their engagement party. The reunion started with the announcement that they had broken up their <laughs> classic, yeah, classic. Yeah, classic Vanderpump. Vanderpump. But this is also the healthiest thing that's happened on this show. Sure, like, yes, call about. it off. Walk away. Yeah, don't enter into a le- a contract, a lifelong yeah. contract with one of these people. You can have your yeah. your annual employment contract with these people okay do not bind every aspect of your life forever with any of these people no absolutely not no don't do it 
so they were gonna have they were having their engagement party at this like gorgeous vineyard like it was practically a wedding at that point like it was this gorgeous vine vineyard in northern california they invited up their friends and brock sheena's fiance who had just proposed to her a few, a few days before was like you know what we should do is we should get married here secretly during their engagement <laughs> <weekend>. <laughs> And it was one of those things where it was like, it was clearly purely about the show. I mean, to some extent, it was about like, it's not clear how much he's using people for money and stuff. But also, it was clearly like, we only have these many days left for filming. Right? So we need to get our wedding in now. <laughs> like, this is the point. It was, it was wild. The whole season leading up to this moment was pretty dull. Those few moments. And it's like, it's the peak kind of thing where you're like, Right, I am judging you, but I am so glad you did I'm, this. Because, yeah, like, I'm deeply this is yeah. amazing to watch. I'm missing several seasons. I might watch that finale. That's insane. <laughs> yeah. That's insane. That's if you watch like, the last three episodes, unhinged, unhinged. Yeah, yeah. Why? actually, you can just watch the finale. The finale is like where everything falls apart, and you just like, even Lisa, like who has supported Sheena through like the dumbest mistakes, is like girl <laughs> and then when you see like the way that Raquel's crying through this because she's the sweetest person on this entire universe apparently like, it's it's fascinating oh, don't watch the everything before just watch the finale because okay. you're just like I'm down I'm down yeah beautiful <laughs> wonderful um the Vanderpump chapter also does sort of tie back into like larger arguments about tv because she talks a lot about like reality tv more broadly throughout it yeah. and like it's, it's more just like this is the one that I picked to write about yeah. but like I I she knows she drops her reality tv credential yeah. fan credentials um yeah. at the top of the essay uh but then talks about basically how reality tv is the tv of tv um, mm, yeah. <laughs> uh, um which i thought was uh you know it's fun and interesting because there is like there's this whole there is a whole other um you know even as like she's unpacking a lot of the ideas around you know prestige television and like what 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 does it mean for some tv to count as art and some of it not basically mm -hmm. um her argument kind of seems to be it's all art um it's yeah. just different kinds of art um which yeah. i agree uh, mm -hmm. or maybe i'm just reading that as her argument because that's how i feel but anyway um uh, I agree with you. <laughs> i'm on board i agree <laughs> great good yeah. uh two out of two hosts of yeah. nonfiction book club agree <laughs> yeah. um, if you're in the chat and you disagree well you're in the chat <laughs> antagonize your audience that's a winning move i don't remember what i was saying our own set of bad fans yeah um <laughs> we hate them not we hate you you will hate us you the yeah, fans will hate us that's correct that's yes. what we're trying to do here yeah. uh i don't even remember what i was going to say about reality tv oh the the genres that there's like that there's also a little bit of like a little bit of that within sort of talking about reality tv also though yeah. like like there's like the competition shows and then even with like the competition shows there was this this there's the there's the ones that try to pitch the same thing but like it's a social experiment yeah like, uh, yeah. like that language like how to like yeah. the attempts to sort of dress up the idea of a reality tv show and it's like that's listen it's it's this is just yeah. another one yeah. like all the others before it yeah. um <laughs> anyway no, mm -hmm. I agree. It, it is always funny to me, like, when you meet people, like, you get a sense. I feel like reality TV is, like, a great litmus test for, like, what kind of person you're talking to. Because, like, I've met people and they've been, like, I'm, like, what, they're, like, what do you like? I'm, like, I watch TV. I'm, like, what kind of TV? I watch a lot of reality TV. They're, like, oh, I also watch reality TV. I watch, like, really trashy things, like Top Chef. As soon as they say that, I'm, like, we're oh, not the same people. We are like, not the same. Yeah, Top Chef, Top Chef is the, the Sopranos of, yeah. um, of, like, reality Those are people TV. who can do things. Yeah, that's, those people have, like, actual skills. Um, all of those people can walk off of that show and get a normal ass job yeah um <laughs> uh i watch the challenge and when that show isn't happening, those people are uh club yeah. promoters yeah. and some of them are the ones who are like winners are trainers uh at yeah. gyms <laughs> um, yeah. the ones who are good uh yeah uh and like the reason the only reason that they're trainers that at the gym is because they just have to be at the gym all the time when they're not filming that's like in, they're yeah. like incidentally while i'm here 
I'll like make some money. <laughs> are you uh, are you excited about all the weird challenges that are going to be coming up? Because isn't like their whole behind. challenge expansion? Oh, okay. I feel I'm, like there's like a whole challenge expansion plan for CBS that they announced. That's like international challenges oh, and then like also the like yeah, yeah yeah and I think that's like their way of trying to like any rate all the other CBS reality because they've had like all the Survivor and like all the people going now. It it but I I don't like yeah the incorporation of all of the other people from the other shows. I I yeah. don't know it bums me. I I I liked it when it was in, when it was MTV insular when yeah. it was when it was just insular to uh mtv reality shows first of all i am i'm lightly bitter about it because i feel that the superior season of are you the one got shafted by happening mm -hmm. after they started incorporating yes. all of these other people and that's a tragedy um yeah that, that the only person from that season was itty bitty amber yeah that's, i mean i love her but also she yeah she not weighs two pounds. She's not. Yeah. She doesn't have. She doesn't have a chance. Um, yeah. Anyway, uh, but I there, there's like a there's a there's just like a different vibe and a different energy to the MTV yeah. reality shows that like the when they start some of the worst seasons of the challenge in my opinion are Big Brother dominated seasons because they mm -hmm. basically came in and broke the game because yeah. they were like uh, the MTV people. Um, they have so much history and like hate each other so much. That yeah, but so deeply. It's so deeply that like yeah. th they are routinely bad at the at the long game. Like they're always yeah. bad at the long game. The long game in, on the show never needs to be that comp ne needed in the past to be that complicated because they were just not like they. There's just a bunch of hot idiots. Okay, mm -hmm. they just angry with each other um yeah. and they would get drunk all the time and like that's it the big brother people walked in and day one were like listen here's the here's the big picture <laughs> yeah. um and if like we it, stick together we can win money <laughs> uh and the mtv hot idiots at first were like no we're all gonna take you out and there was a brief period there where the numbers were in favor of the yeah. mtv folks like they had they had the numbers to to uh defend the old guard yeah. of the show against the incursion of intellectual yeah. reality contestants uh, <laughs> the intellectuals of big brother yeah. uh, um uh but in the end the big this brother is what we mean by layers layers <laughs> yes yeah. yeah, so what you need to know about the layers of reality tv are that yeah top chef is the sopranos i am on a tier where big brother is the intellectual contest <laughs> <laughs> i want those intellectuals off my show yeah <laughs> with the exception of, of um devon she's allowed she's the oh, she's, yeah, i don't she think she'll great. ever come back she'll never come yeah. back yeah um, she had like she, a good mtv energy to her like she, she was could. like ready to like play with like that kind of like that kind of character she under she just like deeply understands that she's on a tv show yeah uh, <laughs> um in which is that's that's also one of my that's a, that's a favorite of mine uh yeah. i love that i love yeah that's the only kind of uh in a like intelligence that i'm interested in seeing on these shows is yeah. people who realize that this is a tv show and yeah. are constantly reminding us that it's a tv show <laughs> I love that. This is a truly unhinged. What are we? There was a book that we read. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that we really did turn this into an excuse to talk about TV. That's why we did this. That's yeah. it. That's why yeah. we're here. That was yeah. all we really wanted. <laughs> And it's incredible. I, but I just it made us spend the last like seven minutes talking about a show that does not get mentioned in this <laughs> yeah, book. Yeah. yeah, the challenge I don't think appears. Not once. Not we, once. No, not even in a whole list of credentials. No. Um, that is the power of, of the challenge. Is that yeah. Even when it is not mentioned, it will get mentioned. I, I will work it into any conversation yeah um so i do want to note that in my notes during the vanderpump essay i did note a specific gripe that i have because my one defense of one person in this show is i think ariana in the fandom gets called and labeled a cool girl a lot mm -hmm. and like in a weird way that i think is actually both incorrect and like to her and incorrect to the definition of a cool girl interesting for anybody who cares which is like me She's like, basically she comes onto the show 
mid second season is sort of the voice of reason to whatever extent the show can have a voice of reason. To, mostly to, because, again, without breaking the show to, yeah. to the extent that it's possible. Yeah. Mostly because the person that she is almost immediately like put at odds with is the absolute voice of unreason on the yeah. show. Like the absolute lack of reason like she is pure purely driven on her emotions and uh-huh. does not understand reason which uh-huh. works great for the show yeah but she has like this point where she talks about like the chill babes who don't mind their boyfriends taking you guys on a trip to vegas and i always this is my specific fandom gripe is people uh-huh. like will bring up this time that ariana or like they'll talk about ariana like as this cool girl who's always letting guys just do whatever but I have to point out that she is one of the few girls on the show who like has a healthy conversation with her yeah. boyfriend about not going to Vegas where she's just uh-huh. like, Hey, this makes me feel sad. But then yeah. he goes to Vegas. But, yeah, and then he does yeah. it anyway. That's, that's true. That's because of her birthday. Is that, is that the one? I think it's like, of? it's like after her birthday and I think it's like yeah. a year or something after her dad had died. And so she was like, yeah. or like maybe two or something. Yeah. 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 Yes, I do. I do sort of remember that. No one cares. This is like my specific (laughs) gripe. I I appreciate. I appreciate that defense of Ariana as somebody who would also describe her as the as as that as being the 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 archetypal cool girl. um, Yeah. Show. Um, But that's that's fair. Uh, also like like to enjoy it you have like uh, she compares Vanderpump Rules to being a sports fan to enjoy it you just have to ignore the potential brain damage for the players once the game ends like football yeah. which is like a very real experience of watching the show where you're like yes. just like purely from a health standpoint with the amount of like None drugs of and alcohol, alcohol that they've uh-huh. consumed and then from an emotional standpoint I just of, like, can't imagine these are, these are terrible people actively ruining each other's lives um, yeah yeah I highly recommend it to people. <laughs> you should watch the fun. first. The first few seasons are fun. Yeah. yeah. The first three are great. Then four through six are solid. They're not as like spectacular as the first three. I think the first two seasons are legitimately some of the greatest television mm-hmm. ever made. Like they have a narrative structure to them and arc that mm-hmm. pays off in ways that you're not expecting, or at least I did not I expect. just can't handle I just can't handle the entirety of the way the show handles Jax as a person. Yeah. That, I realized That's the only thing that, that made the last season worth it before this season. This is, um, I, so I've been on a, like a major rom-com kick lately. Um, and I watched not, uh, I don't know, sometime like a week ago, I watched, uh, uh, um, you again, which isn't really a rom com. It's actually more just like general chick flick. Um, because it's it, Kristen. Uh, Kristen. I thought Bell. you said you. You meant you, like the serial you, killer show. No, like, you again. You again. The 2010 <laughs> movie starring Kristen Bell. Um, doesn't the movie itself does not matter? But I have not been able to stop thinking about how angry this movie made me because mm-hmm. it's built around gaslighting. Like that's the whole oh, thing. Yeah. Um, and I realized that that's. Uh, and I was thinking about how like um, I don't know when talking about like kids media things I lose my I like cannot handle like shitty parents like it it bothers me in a way that like like unless yeah. it's and I like I need the text to engage very explicitly with the fact that the parents are shitty and a lot of times it doesn't and it like yeah. I lose my mm-hmm. mind over it um yeah that's like a media thing that it's not that that's like a me I get that like it's it's like no, part of the world and it's fine I cannot I cannot handle it. I can't. My sense of yeah. justice. Yeah. Cannot handle it. Yeah. <laughs> it no, bothers I think that's very me. Fair. I and need. I think, like, I think they need to get their due. Like rules. Yeah. So this is like why I have stuck with the show is for that. Like those small. Like when I say small, I mean like we're talking like slivers out of slivers of yeah. like moments of justice. Yeah, th- this and is real Stockholm. Has a, like the Stockholm smallest of moment of justice for Jax. Like the smallest one. And it's like layered with the knowledge that he's also married to this girl who is going to suffer with him like for the rest of like however long they're, well, I, mean, I, I, I would say for the rest of their lives but they're not gonna they're that's they have a kid together so like, oh that's true even if they yeah. even when not if yeah when they get yeah. divorced they but the, the last episode the of, of season eight made so season eight was like truly aggravating to watch as a fan because jacks jacks who if you for whatever context you need all you need to know if you haven't watched the shows he is truly terrible he's like, the worst person. i like i feel like on the, the show. Wor- of uh, setting aside actual murderers 
he's the worst person yeah. I've ever seen on television. Yeah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and the show in season eight, like, keeps trying to convince you that he's changed. No! And, like, you're just watching it and you're like, I... I know he has not. And then at the end, there's like a little moment where there's like a there's little like bit a of like a sad, right. subdued tone to your voice as you say that. I know. <laughs> I am the bad fan. <laughs> I like talked earlier about like talked all this shit about people who are like sincerely invested in this show. And now here I am like sincerely invested in what this show has done to me. Incredible. Incredible. <laughs> Yeah. Anyways, I'm sorry. I've derailed us with Vanderpump Rules talk. But... We gave up on having a real conversation 30 minutes ago. But I think that what happened, I think if we're going to get meta about it, we have exemplified the book. Uh -huh. We talked about being a fan. Yes. I feel like we've, we've, we've been Bringing talking it back around. Beautiful. Yeah. What an intellectual. Yeah. A scholar. Yeah. So... I'm curious if, I, if anyone else has any other essays that they really enjoyed, feel free to bring them up um, yeah, while we are we read. here. Um, I really like the Hannibal essay too. Like the the section on like the last section in praise or one of the last sections in praise of sex and violence. Mm -hmm. Like a lot of those essays grouped together, I thought were um, interesting. Yeah, yes. Yeah, the, uh, the SVU one was also, I thought, was really interesting as well, um, talking about, like, displays of very traumatic scenes on TV. The only one of these that I reread was the Jessica Jones one. Oh, yeah. Um, although I'm upset now because the Americans, I didn't even remember that there was one on the Americans. Oh, yeah. And that is one of my favorite TV shows of all time. Um, yeah. Yeah strong strong feelings that it is it. one of the best tv shows it has one of my favorite series finales of all time oh um, yeah it what it's so it's like it's this really really beautiful mix of like i didn't see it coming and also it's inevitable mm. at the same time like it was like yeah. this, yep that like this was it uh it's the you know the it's what it's what Game of Thrones wishes it did, you know. Um, yeah. Uh, but it's a lot yeah. smaller because the story is in general a lot smaller because it's really it's like a family story. Um, yeah. But mask masquerading as a spy story, uh, it's really good. I just want more people to watch The Americans and tell me and talk to me about it or The Challenge. If those are your choices. Those are yeah. the things. Those are the two things I'm interested in discussing. Um, yeah. If you want to be an intellectual. You can watch The Americans and talk to me about it. If you want to get down to my level, <laughs> you can yeah. watch the challenge and talk to yeah. me. <laughs> One day we're just, we're just going to completely, we're going to be like, we're talking about this book, but you guys are going to show up and it's actually just going to be an hour discussion on the challenge. Yeah. I guess one of the books we had thought about was a book about MTV history. So uh -huh. we could end up doing it. Listen, it's, anything is possible. Um... Uh, I thought I wasn't going to be invested since I don't watch much TV. I haven't watched a single show talked about in the book, uh, but I ended up really just, just enjoying the discussions in this book. Yeah, I so the reread was interesting because there were a couple shows like Vanderpump Rules that like I hadn't, mm. you know, but like coming back yeah. around, yes. Um, but this is also like I love stuff like this in general, just because like it's media criticism. Like I find yeah. I um the like the the whole run of like the the new Star Wars movies coming out. I mean, I did eventually. I have now seen the new trilogy, and that's it. That's all mm -hmm. the Star Wars movies I've seen. I don't give a shit about Star Wars, but I have read so much. Mm -hmm like media criticism about this franchise yeah. because it's so ubiquitous because it's the thing that everybody wants to write about. And I'm like, cool, I really don't care. Like, I just want to, I want to hear people having big thinky thoughts about, yeah, about the, the dumb pew pew space movies. Like that. I love <laughs> that. Like that. Yeah. That's my shit. Uh, so yeah. I, yeah, that to me, like the appeal of this book is, is that like, is that it's, it's, mm -hmm. it's interesting to have, like to hear this analysis and so much of what she's talking about, like how, has broader applicability like you can you know even if you don't watch any of the shows that you even like even if you're you let's say you read more read and you don't really watch a lot of yeah. tv like that's like that's your prime your go-to medium there's still a lot that she's talking about here that has that's just like about storytelling you know yeah. that 
uh, yeah. I think that has broader applicability. Um, and also, and she's just, she's very smart and thoughtful and yeah. 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 yeah Cause she has very focused on story. Like I, I think like a lot of film criticism that focuses on like visuals and stuff. Like I, you know, if it's something that's like, they're just, they're like making a very visual argument and they use visuals along the way. Like I'm like, Oh, that's cool. That's interesting. Like something like a video essay, like that kind of thing I love. But otherwise like there are times where I've read film criticism where I'm like, I don't like, I don't speak this language. I don't Mm. like, this is a thing that doesn't resonate with me. I don't understand this kind of like, which is fine. Like, you know, there are people who do, I'm just, I'm not that person. So it's like, just not a way that I understand the things that I watch. Uh Um, But like stuff like story, like you're saying, like, even if you don't watch a lot of TV, the, the narrative and stuff like that is, stuff that we're all experiencing in some way or another and like right. like you know she ties this to stuff like trump like how he talks like that kind of thing was you're like yeah yeah 100 percent. like and especially in this day and age even if like you know like we're on a screen we're talking we're making choices about how we talk we're making choices uh-huh. about how we present ourselves like all those things are are wrapped up um just like in the way our world works now so yeah yeah yes yeah it's yeah. very cool yeah, this is a this is a book everyone. club. This is this is. Yeah. I mean, that's uh, maybe we should just end this with the TV book club. Oh my <laughs> God. Well, on yeah. that note, next time, um, I mentioned <laughs> earlier that I'm on a whole kick right now, um, and I, I, for context, I sent Deboki a picture of two books, and the, these two books, I didn't tell you this, Deboki are just mm-hmm. the two that I happen to own. I also have three more that I checked out from the library that are also awesome. in this same vein. I, like when I say <laughs> that I'm in, I'm on a, I'm, 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 I'm on one, I'm on one. Yeah. Um, uh, so the two books, well, the book that we're going to do next time is The Girl in the Show, Three Generations of Comedy, Culture, and Feminism by Anna Fields. Um, the kick is it's, it's, it's just different movies about, or different books about like the history of, of women in comedy. So the other book, which actually I sent her, I sent my, the two books to Deboki before I got to it. She actually, um, Emily Nussbaum mentioned this book actually twice in Mm -hmm. here. Uh, we killed the rise of women in American comedy, a very oral history. My concern with this though, is that just because it's, uh, oral history and like flipping through it it's like you can see um i am a little bit concerned about being being able to talk about it i like i it reminded me of our struggle to discuss stonewall reader uh (laughs) that was my first thought when i saw this i was like i don't know how how well that will function for this having read neither of these books um but this one feels more like I don't know, classically nonfiction. This feels like it'll be a little bit easier for us to talk about. Um, yeah. My my library books, though, if anybody's also interested in joining me on this journey and like wants to message me about books about women in comedy. Uh, yeah. um, the League of Extraordinarily Funny Women, which is also like sort of anthology. It's just like a, it's just a bunch mm-hmm. of like short bios about different female comedians. Um, the Book of Joan, and it's Melissa Rivers talking about Joan Rivers. Very excited about that. Um, and then a uh, um, Lucille Ball's autobiography. I think it's autobiography. Actually, now maybe I'm wrong about that. But anyway, those yeah. are the books that I'm currently that I currently have. I, I have <laughs> it in my head that I, I have this idea. Um, I probably shouldn't tell you because now that I've said it out loud, it'll probably make me not want to do it. But mm. that's fine. Um, I. <laughs> I have this idea that I, what I would like to try and do. I had a couple different thing ways that I would sort of like to go about this, but um, there's like other other. I have other iterations besides this immediate one, but I have this idea to make um, a, a dress that is more or less the the black dress that Midge wears during much of the first season of the Marvelous Mrs. Maisel, yeah, and do like a sewing vlog but that is also sort of video essay E. And so like what throughout yeah. it to be talking about all of these books, this is why yeah. I have amassed this collection of books. Yeah. I don't know if I'll ever actually do this. But I, may have <laughs> I know de- that feeling too, but I'm rooting for this. I may have decreased the odds of my doing it by virtue of, <laughs> of ter- making it, I don't know, homeworky almost because I yeah. told people I would do it. Now yeah. I can't do it. Um, <laughs> people are expecting me to do something. Absolutely not. Um, yeah. 
that's the type of person that I am. So we'll see. Yeah. <laughs> anyway. Well, I hope to one day see this. <laughs> see my video. Uh, yeah. yeah. Um, but anyway, realized, th this is the book. This is the book. Yeah. I realized just now that we might have to change our time next week or next month because scheduling stuff. So we will get back to you all when we have a date figured out. Yeah. So Woo. thanks everyone for joining us for our, our TV edition of Nonfiction Book Club. Uh -huh. Join us next month for our comedy edition of yep. Nonfiction Book Club. Probably more, yeah, more TV again, yep. really. We're turning this into <laughs> uh, TV, you know, how many how many consecutive books can we choose that are actually uh, about <laughs> TV? Uh <Yep. laughs> And then I'm sure we'll pick something very devastating, like emotionally and intellectually. Yeah, that's it. Those are our two tracks. Those are that's yeah. those are the either <laughs> the only nonfiction books that exist. That's correct. Nonfiction book club. Either we're going to talk about TV, or we're going to talk about why everything is terrible. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's On it. that note, <laughs> bye.